Okay, the next video will be about uh, the PCA. So PCA or principal component analysis. <coughs> principal component And this is a methodology based on linear algebra, actually, that allows us to um, uh, to e to analyze multidimensional data, as we will see later on. Multidimensional. In a way that we can plot them in new axes or study them in new axes, but these axes are ordered based on the variances of the data points in these axes. <coughs> so the first axis will have the greatest variance, the second axis the second greatest variance, and so on. So okay, let's, let's make things a bit simpler now and assume the following problem. Assume that we have 10 organisms, so 10 individuals, And each individual is represented by two genes. Now, for example, <coughs> for gene 1, we have these 10 measurements, 3.3, 8.7, 6.5, and so on, for the last individual, 3.2. And for gene 2, we have the measurements 4.7, 8.1, 6.5, and so on, and the last one, 1.1. That means that the first individual has this measurement for the first gene and this measurement for the second gene. In other words, the first individual can be um, represented by this ordered pair of genes and the values 3.3 and 4.7. The same we can do for every individual. We can represent it as a pair of G1, G2 for each individual eye. Now, this is nice here because it means that every individual actually is a point um, in a, on a 2D plane and this point is clearly defined with these coordinates for individual one or in general for these coordinates for the eye individual. For example, these 10 individuals here can be represented with these data points. This axis is gene 1 and this axis is expression of gene 2. And for example, the first individual with the values 3.3 and 4.7 is this guy here. Now, if we see these data points here, we immediately observe the following trend that it seems to us that these measurements of the two genes are not independent statistically. Which means that when we have a big measurement for gene 1, something like that, here, we also have a big measurement for gene 2 for the same individual. So when the expression level of gene 1 increases, it seems that the, f the same trend is followed by gene 2. This is something that we must keep in mind. And also it's possible, but this is not happening in our case, that the expression levels of gene 1 and gene 2 may have a very different expression levels. For example, the gene 1 might be because, uh, between 0 and 10, the expression levels of gene 1, whereas the expression level of, e of gene 2 might be between 1000 and 1500. Now, this variance difference here along the gene 1 and gene 2 has the following problem that if we want somehow to measure the variance of individuals in terms of gene expressions, 
This gene 2 has the greatest variance, very big variance compared to gene 1 and therefore it will occupy most of the variance, most of the total variance. Therefore if we want really to examine what's happening in the different genes regarding the variation, usually it's more, it's better to normalize the data. So instead of having the real expression levels for each gene, we get the normalized expression levels. So some difficult mathematical operation here. We just take each measurement for gene 1. So, or, or let's say that first we take the average value of gene 1. And it's this x here. And then we subtract from this mean value every measurement of gene 1. So we get this difference and then we divide by the standard deviation of this x vector. So of the expression levels of uh, gene 1. In order to illustrate that graphically, imagine that um, the values of gene 1 are is something like that. Okay, these are negative values, but let's say that 0 is here. Okay, forget about this. So these are the values of gene 1. And what we do is that we convert this vector of these data points. So these are our measurements. For example, the first individual has 3.7, the second one 4.8, and so on. We convert these measurements to, to a, a new vector um, the, whose um, variance is 1, standard deviation is 1, and um, the mean of this vector is 0. And in order to do that, we have to subtract from each value the average, the average is somewhere here, and then divide each measurement, so this 3.7, by the standard deviation of these points. And this vector will become something like that. There is a one-to-one -one representation here, so this point will be this point, this point will be this point, this point will be this point, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, if we plot the normalized expression levels for gene 1 and g2 remember that this was the plot before and this is the new plot now they are exactly identical the only thing that changes is the axis here so these data points now are around the zero so this is the zero zero point here zero for this axis and zero for this axis so the data points are around 0 and the variance of these points is the standard deviation of these points is 1. So nothing changed actually compared to the first plot, just the points are nicely uh, distributed here with the same standard deviation for the x and the y axis and they are distributed around 0. Now this is comfortable for us because we can study what's happening on these points, we will see that later on for lines that pass through the zero zero something like that and you will understand this later on that's why we want to bring them to, to zero okay now if we imagine such a line this line epsilon here um, we want to study how the projection of this point on the line how they behave. So it's very easy to, to bring a projection of a point on a line. So if we have this point here, for example, I bring a perpendicular line to the perpendicular segment of the line, and this point that crosses the line is a projection of this point A to the line. So in a similar fashion, I bring this line here. From these points that are below the line, I bring this segment, so it's this point, and so on and so forth. 
So I get these projections that I draw here on this line. And I observe that the initial points, so these points here, had some variance, which means that they, they have some differences between them. And also these points here have some variance, which is different than the original one. So these points have some variance because they differ from their mean. So if the mean is here, for example, then all these purple uh, lines denote how they, they differ from the mean value. So this is a measurement. This, this uh, distance is here are measurements of their variance. Okay, so um, compared to the initial variance that they had, the projections also have some variance, which is probably smaller than the original variance. It's just a proportion of the original variance uh, on the projection. Now, if we would take another line, epsilon prime, so this blue one, and then we would bring the projections again. We observe that the data points on this epsilon prime line have different variances. And compared to the first one, epsilon has definitely a greatest variance than epsilon prime. Okay, and the question is, can we find a line along which the variance of the data points is the greatest. So the line on which the projections of the points have the greatest variance. And it turns out that this is possible mathematically. I will not go so much into the details. It has no me meaning in such a class like this one. But I, I will just say a few things intuitively here what's happening. So what we're going to find is the line so if we have some data points here we're going to find the line so this will be the line in this case along which the projection of the points on this line have the greatest variance compared to any other line so something like that this could be another line and the projections could be like that So we want to actually to find the direction of maximum variance and in order to do that it turns out that we have to study the covariance matrix of our measurements. And to be more precise here the covariance matrix of the normalized measurements. So let's have a look again on the normalized uh, measurements. I have taken the expression values, I have subtracted them uh, from the mean, and I have divided by the standard devi deviation, and I have taken these measurements for gene 1, and these measurements for gene 2. So these measurements here, 0 0.07, 0 0.07, 1.07, 1.07, and so on, form a matrix with two columns and ten rows because we have ten individuals and two genes. And the covariance matrix of this table here is a square matrix. The dimensions of this matrix is 2 by 2 because I have measured two two genes. If I would have measured three genes, the dimensions of this matrix could be 3 by 3, and so on. And this matrix, the covariance matrix, is symmetrical. Now the diagonal is the variance of these values 
So this point is the variance of these values and the variance of the second gene is here. So if I could have a third gene, its variance would be the 3-3 three, three point somewhere here and so on. So the off diagonal then uh, numbers of the covariance matrix tell me something about the behavior of gene 1 compared to gene 2 and vice versa. And as we see here, the, uh, the expression levels of the two genes are positively correlated, which means that if um, gene 1 increases the expression level, then the same is happening for gene 2. And um, this is illustrated here by the positive value of diagonally. So this is the point 1, 2, and this is the point 2, 1. And it tells us that compared, so it, if it is positive, it tells us that both genes behave uh, with the same way. So when one increases, the other one increases as well. So the higher this value is, the more positive this value is, the closer these points are to the line. So for example, the covariance of these guys here is smaller than the covariance of these guys here. Because here they form quite nice line and they deviate very li very little from the line and here the noise is much greater something like that and in the extreme case that is something like that then the covariance is zero which means that when we increase gene 1, we cannot predict how gene 2 will change. We increase gene 1 in this direction, but gene 2 might either go up or it might go down. For example, when we increase the, um, the expression level from this point to this point, then some genes go up, but some other genes go down, and so on and so forth. Okay, so these are the this is the covariance matrix. Again, I say that the dimensions is um, the number of the features here, of the measurements of the of the genes that we measure by the number of the genes that I measure. So it's a square matrix and it's symmetric. So it's a square symmetric matrix. Now it turns out that this matrix is very important important in order to um, find the direction of the maximum variance. So if we have a new vector u and sigma is this covariance matrix, if we multiply sigma by u, remember that this will be a p by p matrix and this u will be a vector p by 1 so this multiplication will be a new vector p by 1 now this vector is denoting the variance of each element in the direction of u also it turns out that the maximum variance uh, can be found if this u here is what is called um, the eigenvector, an eigenvector, the first eigenvector, eigenvector of the matrix. So the eigenvector has the following property. The eigenvector of a square matrix has the following property. If I multiply this 
vector with the matrix then this is the same as if I will multiply this vector with some number so the, only the eigenvectors have this property and for a square matrix of dimension p by p there are p such eigenvectors again I, I must say that graphically I have this matrix sigma and I have a vector here, this u now if I will do this multiplication in general for every matrix A and for any other vector V then I get another vector V prime which it might be like that so this is a vector V here I multiply this matrix by this vector and then I get a, another vector V prime which might be different than um, the V in terms of uh, length so for example this one is bigger and in terms of angle of direction so this one is this direction whereas the original one had this direction so it's like a matrix transforms the vector into another vector however the eigenvector of some matrix so this one has the following property if I multiply if I multiply this V here with a, um, with a matrix sigma the only thing that changes is the size of the vector by a factor lambda so this one will be lambda u it can go to the other direction as well if the lambda is negative but the angle will not change so it will be along the same direction and there are um, p such different vectors that for a square matrix of p by p have this property and it turns out mathematically that exactly these vectors exactly these directions of these vectors are the directions along which um, the variance is maximized so the first so the the vector with the greatest lambda so from this equation here the greatest with the, the, the vector with the greatest lambda is the, the, uh, the direction defines the direction along which uh, the data points have the greatest variance and in order to see that graphically so if I have these points this vector here, this direction here is the direction along which the variance of the points is the greatest so these are the projections and they have some variance of course if I would have any other line passing from 0, 0 then so this is 0, 0 here then the variance along this line would be smaller than the variance on this line another nice property is that um, the second eigenvector since this matrix is symmetric actually so for symmetrical matrices the second eigenvector is perpendicular to the first one so it will be like that to this one so this red will be the eigenvector 1 and this will be the eigenvector 2 so this will have the greatest lambda and the, this will have the second greatest lambda now why this um, perpendicular directions are interesting because the first direction explains some variance but it cannot explain all the variance and specifically it cannot explain this variance that is perpendicular to the line so for example if I will have a point here and a point here then these points definitely they are not exactly the same 
but along this is this axis they are the same because they have the same projection so I lose some variance and this what I lose is the variance that is perpendicular to the line but this variance is captured by the second eigenvector now because this is exactly perpendicular to the first line so I have managed with these two vectors to capture all the variance of the points in an order that the first eigenvector has the greatest variance and the second eigenvector has the second greatest variance so this is illustrated nicely here I have this original point, so this one, 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 this, this, and this two here. The projections along this red axis is the eigenvector one, it's called principal component one, and, the and this axis here is called the principal component two. And principal component one explains greater variance than principal component two. And the variance that principal component 1 explains cannot be explained by the principal component 2 and vice versa, the variance of the second principal component cannot be explained by uh, the variance of the first principal component. So if we see some numbers exactly for our data points here, PC1, principal component 1 explains 87% of the variance whereas principal component 2 explains 13% of the variance so we see how much greater variance principal component 1 can explain now if you have seen some PCA plots then what's happening is the following so we have this principal component axis and what we do is that we rotate this to make this red one our new x-axis and this one to become our new y-axis and sometimes mathematically what's happening is that we have a flip also so this one might, might come here and you know this one might come here this might happen if we have negative lambda, co lambda coefficients these values are negative these values might be negative so we don't have any guarantee that um, they will remain just with a the rotation, they might be flipped like that or like that but again it's the same, so here what has happened is that these two points are actually here and these points are here and these points are here and these points here are down there So the new axis do not have any specific biological meaning. So in the previous, in the original representation, so this axis is the normalized expression values of gene 1 and here is the normalized expression values of gene 2. But now this axis, the new axis here, after the rotation, uh, do not have any specific meaning. Uh, they are just linear combinations of the two genes. For example, a linear combination of the two genes might be take 0 0.5 from gene 1 and subtract 1.2 from gene 2. And do the same for all genes and then you will have these representations, representations here. And for this axis, you might have something similar. Take minus 1.2 of gene 1 and subtract 0 0.1 of gene 2. And you have this axis here. So this is the first and this is the second. Now, this might, be, this might seem strange to you. Okay, why to do all that? The reason is that we have ordered the axis uh, from greatest variance to lower variances and we can see some properties of the, um, of the data easier in this way. Um, for example, and, yeah, and, and the other thing 
you will understand this reason now is that we can keep just one axis or just fewer axes than the original data losing not so much variance so for example if this is the case this will be the principal component one and then we can say okay we don't want anymore to re represent our data in two dimensions we'll keep only one dimension so now our data let's, let's illustrate them like that so we have these points here so this is the axis of the greatest variance and our data will be on this axis like that again we can see that the clustering some clustering behavior of the data here is preserved in one dimension because it happens that this direction is the direction of the greatest variance it's not always that a clustering will be uh, remain here for example if we have another group of genes like that then okay now the the axis of the greatest uh, uh, the axis of the greatest um, variance will be something like that I guess it could be a bit shifted towards this one but this along this axis the variance will be lost because these points will be here and all these points will be here so this uh, will be our new data points again we will have this our cluster here the other one but we will lose the information for this cluster and this information will be recovered now on the second principal component okay um, but you can imagine how useful is something like that if we have measurements for 10,000 genes which means that each individual is a vector of um, um, 10,000 dimensions not just two but 10,000 dimensions and we can now go from 10,000 dimensions into two or three or even one dimension with the greatest variances and we can plot the points into dimensions definitely we can do that and um, observe some patterns there so PCA is a methodology that allows us to sort the variance of the data points uh, in axis from the greatest variance to lo the lower variance keep just a few axes not all of them and observe some general properties of the data like if they form clusters and so on this is the most usual thing that we want to see or the distance between the points for example we might see that um, these blue guys for example are closer to the to these points here compared to this cluster here so we might say that these individuals have si more similar expression levels to these individuals than or the, the blue ones are more similar to the red ones than the blue ones to the purple ones so even though this should not be a definitive conclusion PCA allows us to see the data because we can uh, plot them and reach or test such hypotheses so this is all, I hope it was helpful, thank you very much.